My name is Father John Ely. I'm presently the parish priest here at St. Aloysius Church and in St. Dominic's, which is the neighboring parish. Uh, I have been in St. Aloysius for 23 years as the parish priest and in St. Dominic's for four years as the parish priest. I was ordained in 1984, so I've been a priest for 33 years. Um, and the journey towards priesthood was an easy one, I suppose, in many respects. I didn't find um, any moments where I had great doubts. We were, uh, the family was very poor, uh, so there wasn't very great deal to, uh, to lend itself to what people today would think was good. But I thought it was good because there was much love around and it prepared me for entry into uh, the, the priesthood and religious life. I like to, um, to be involved with the computer because I, I like playing around with computers. I build them and I, I uh, program them. So I, I do things like that, all for the church, because I want to do, I like to produce things, publications for, the, for use in, in parish and, and all that kind of stuff. That's where my interest is. Although I do do other things on the computer, particularly when people ask me, because it, it's just something I picked up. So I like working with computers. I also like going out sometimes, particularly out into the country. It's nice to be um, free, away from the traffic and away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. And it's nice to feel some fresh air sometimes in the lungs. So I like to do that, but not very often, obviously, because that, that would take a bit more time. But I do like it when I'm able to. I'm also, um, and I, I like to read different books and I'm also a Trekkie. If you know what a Trekkie is, I love to be a part of the Trekkie world to me is, is almost, it's next to heaven because I would love to be a space traveler. I would love to be able to do those kind of things. And I suppose watching these program, watching that, those films and the programs that were on and I've got them, every single one of them on DVD. So, uh, but watching them takes you into another world. You escape a little bit. Um, and I like to be like that. And I'm a great Star Wars fan too, um, but not as much as Star Trek. Star Trek is my ultimate. I am happy because my life is rooted in Jesus and it's where I want it to be. But it's not so rooted in Jesus that I'm... Uh, my boss once, when I was working, before I became a priest, my boss, describing his sister, said that she was so heavenly minded. She was no earthly good. Um, and I find that I, in, in life, I want to be heavenly minded, but I don't want to be so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good to people. So I, I, I like to do things as well as be a, a priest in the church. I've got my, my own life outside of it, which is no, not as much as it might be if I was outside of, li uh, of the church's life, but it's, it's enough for me. And I'm happy because I feel Jesus present in me. When I stand at the altar, to celebrate Mass. I feel him there with me. And I often have, not visions because I don't see anything, but I have a feeling that the angels are around me. And I feel supported by such a wonderful spiritual network, which makes me feel happy and, and, and ready to do these things. And I don't feel as if I want to be somewhere else at any given time. I like being where I am at that time. I like to be a servant of God in the way that I am and I think that this is the best life I could ever have. Would you please tell us about your faith formation in your childhood? My faith for ch uh, formation goes right back to my earliest childhood. Um, it's one of the things that I find strange about people today who say that children don't understand things because I can go back to even before I went to school. So I was about four when I first encountered going to church, which became an adventure because it was in um, the earliest time when I moved from Liverpool to Kirby. And we used to have to go to church on Sunday in, in the dark because my dad worked and so we went on Sunday evening to Mass. And one of the things that was uh, adventurous was going out in the dark because we didn't. And then to get to church we needed a torch, which because I was the one boy of seven children at the time, 
my dad would allow me to carry the torch. So it was great to go there like that and then to experience Father talking for the first time. I don't remember any earlier um, experiences of church in that respect. And Father was a great preacher at the time and a very friendly man, particularly towards children. And I found myself being drawn into church life by his own attitude and the way he, he um, interacted with us. And of course, with us, with us seven young children, he was always very much a friend. And then later on when our church was built and we went to church, I used to go obviously with my parents, but my mother particularly, she, it was very early on in the, in the church, that church's life, it was Christmas time. And we had in our house a little crib which my mother took time out to teach us about the, 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 the figures in the crib and who they were, what they were. And it always intrigued me uh, as a little child that Jesus was this God who came from heaven. Only as a child, I understood it as a child, but it was wonderful to think about it. And then later on in our church, um, the priest bought a big statue, a very big statue, uh, which I didn't, hadn't seen before. And my mother told me that it was um, the Pieta statue, where our Blessed Lady holds the dead body of her son after his crucifixion. Um, and I remember not being afraid, but I remember thinking that this great love of Mary for Jesus shone forth in that statue. And that's why in later years I bought one for my own parish here, because it reminded me of my childhood and my mother's teaching and the love that Mary brought into my heart then as a little child in, ch in school. And it also in inspired me into getting up in the early morning on weekdays to go to church. Um, this would have happened when I was about eight, nine, ten, um, going to church on a reasonably really daily basis because, you know, my mother, uh, who was also that kind of a person had taught me that going to church was a really important thing and I, I loved it too, often going on my own. And my mother told me off one day because I got up too early. She wasn't up and I'd gone out to church and she didn't like that. I was too young to be doing things like that. But then later on um, in school, we were taught how going to mass was really important. And so daily mass became a, something that was important to me and it was because of the teaching of our teacher, Miss Falkin. She was very, uh, I think she, her faith was very important to her and she handed it on to us very well. I always thank her in my prayers and thoughts for what she gave to me. And it was towards the end of this time in the junior school, she was still our teacher, when um, a visiting priest from a missionary order came to talk to us boys about the possibility of vocation to the priesthood in the missions. And I remember it inspired me so much so that when I went home from school that day, I asked my mother about the possibility of me becoming a priest. And she said that, no, I couldn't because you needed some money to, to she needed some money to add on to the, my, the cost of my training. We didn't have that. There were too many of us. So that couldn't happen. And I remember when she said, no, that was it, no. I left it at that. My mum had said no, and that was the end of thinking about it for quite a long time. It didn't stop me from going to church or doing the things that I did as a teenager, as you would normally do. Although having said that, my um, church um, relationship was threatened by, because I developed asthma and I couldn't go to church often. And I was in hospital for months on a time. And sometimes, because there was no uh, church in the hospital in Alder Hay at the time that I could go to, uh, it, things became difficult. But afterwards, when I sort of came out of that childhood asthma, I, I started re really going back to church on a, at least a weekly basis, like everybody else. And the first time that I came back to the idea of serving the church in a particular way, was when our priest, one day, I used to go into church and he would be talking to people at the back of the church and I would obviously just walk straight in. And this particular day, he reached out with his arm, pulled me back and said, I want you to read at mass today. And I sort of got, was shocked because those kind of things 
were not the kind of things I expected to do. I was pretty shy, really, as a young person. And so I, the idea of standing up in front of all these people was terrifying. And yet I found when I did it, when I'd done it for that first time, I could face it other times. And so from time to time I did. But I never thought about being a priest. I thought about you know, being a reader at Mass. And later on, about the possibility of being a Eucharistic minister when they came around. But very quickly after that happened, I remember parish priest at the time asked us to write a letter to the Archbishop who was retiring at the time on ill health grounds. And I wrote him a letter uh, to say thank you for his service in the diocese. And it, part of the, the padding out of the letter, I told him about wanting to be a priest as a child, but that now I was too old because I was, I think I was 21 at the time when I wrote this letter. Um, and that because of my asthma uh, experience, I didn't think that they would accept. And he wrote me a letter back saying that none of these things were correct, that I wasn't too old and that asthma wouldn't be a bar. And that was when the whole process of my thinking about vocation as a priest came back to me. I remember, you know, sort of get, getting this letter which sort of made me have to think again about priesthood. And for a little while, I, I thought about it and then I thought, well, I don't know anything about church life. So I got involved in various organizations like the Knights of St. Columba, the Legion of Mary, and other things which I thought a priest would need to know about. And that was my motivation to find out what it would be like to be a priest. How did your faith journey go on as a teenager or as a youth? As a teenager, my faith life was about reading books, reading, saying prayers. My mother, although we didn't have much money, my mother bought me a book, a prayer book to, to have, which I still have and a treasure. And I also, as well, had a lot more time to contemplate things. And I did, I thought about my relationship with God and about how I, I mean, at that time, I, I often thought about death because when you get into a really bad asthma attack, it's easy to think about death. And my thoughts on death were all around about my meeting and my encounter with God, not about being afraid of, of the pain of death, but about my encounter with God. And so in that respect, it was a much more personal and spiritual God that I came to know then than just being going to church and being taught things. And I, I think, you know, even in adversity, God was a very special friend to me, and Mary was like my substitute mother, um, and she became my substitute mother, most definitely, after my own mother died. At what age did you join the seminary? I was 26 when I went. 26 when I finally went to, to, to Osho. And, and that was after quite a bit of discernment prior to going to the seminary because once I'd arrived at 21, 22, you know, when, when I got the letter from the Archbishop, as I said to you, I had, I had a hook into ordinary life. And I was then having to think to myself, would I, would I, would I be okay with the leaving of that and going on to seminary and becoming a priest? Um, and that took a little bit of time. I, I didn't think, it, it wasn't because I was unsure. It was because I needed to be sure that I had a, a firm, a firm understanding of what I was letting myself in for. Um, because although God is calling me, and I've always thought that God was calling me to priesthood, I had to be sure that I could take on that responsibility from my own internal resources, from my own spirituality. And I think that's why it took a few years, really, to, to make that final decision. Would you share with us a bit of your seminary experience? Whether you have got any exciting experiences in your seminary? Well, seminary was not quite the same for me as for most others, because, oh well, not, I don't know about today, but certainly then, most of those who started training for priesthood were 18, straight from school or from junior seminary. Um, and I was 26, so I was eight years older than them by the time I got there. And boy, what a difference was to be seen because some of them were boys, you know, really still boys. And I was an adult, really, quite well on into adulthood. So I found that the beginning of that a bit difficult. I also found 
you know, sort of stepping into book learning and, and writing essays and things like that, difficult. Um, and I didn't really know how to express myself to the seminary profs about that. So I just plodded on, got on with it. And, um, but I found the camaraderie among those students that I was close with, you know, not just close with, but others as well, people who were at the college. I found that very, very good. The seminary itself wasn't wonderful because sometimes it could be very cold. And it was such a vast place that it was impossible to heat. I never, I never blame church authorities for not heating it because this is too, too big to imagine trying to heat it like you would a house. But I found that difficult at, at the beginning and uh, I, I did find going out to visit people in the, in the parishes, which was part of my first year um, training, I found that very comforting because for the first time I was going into people's houses, um, not as a priest, but they, they regarded us as the, the, the future priests, but of, of being able to talk to them about their faith and about how they felt about me turning up at their house and wanting to talk to them. All of them, I never found one of them unenthusiastic. They were all wonderful people, really. And as part of the training process for a priest, they were wonderful. And I'm, I'm sure they'll all be in heaven, enjoying the reward of such. Because they were all old people that we visited. We were meant to go to visit old people. And I doubt whether any of them will still be alive, but I'm sure that they're all enjoying their reward in heaven. I'm sure that you remember your ordination day. And what's your special thoughts and feelings about your ordination? It was the 22nd of July, 1984, Feast of St. Mary Magdalene. And I remember being nervous simply because I was going to be the centre of attention. And uh, as a, you would think that as someone who's offered themselves as a priest, that would be okay. But I remember being nervous because I didn't know whether I would get it right. Afterwards, I thought how stupid such an idea was, but it was a hot day, a very hot day. Um, and I remember one of the things that a priest or a, a, a seminary, no, as deacon who's preparing for priesthood does as part of the, the ordination rite is he lies on the floor. He lays on the floor. In, um, and I remember on that day, it was so hot that when I stood back up again to go to the archbishop, you could see my imprint on the floor in sweat. Right. <laughs> it was so hot. Um, but other than that, I remember there were so many people in the church. I'd never seen the church so full. Never, and see, it, we had a, an organ loft and we had the downstairs and it was packed. It was packed outside as well. You could see all these people from all over. And that was overwhelming that so many people wanted to come to my ordination. But unfortunately, you know, not, there weren't that many ordinations in Kirby, which is the town that I grew up in. Um, and so I, they, some, lots of them knew me, but lots of them didn't as well. They came, I suppose, for the spectacle. Um, but I remember then afterwards, the Archbishop kept me in the presbytery, Sacred Heart Presbytery. I was ordained in Sacred Heart Church in Kirby. He kept me in the presbytery for a while because he sent, he wanted things in the club where the reception afterwards was taking place to settle down before I went. And we went together. And I remember when we first walked through the club door, the Archbishop said to me, it's a good job the fire brigade weren't here because he thought we'd be shut down, because it was packed. And I asked once the, 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 the chairman of the club if he had any idea about how many people were there, and he thought around about 500, which wasn't outlandish from in my mind, but for the club it was terrible because they were only licensed to have 300 in. <laughs> but that was a great, a great day, and I met so many people that, uh, I, I didn't know, but they were related to me, that I didn't know, but they came from far and wide to be there at this great spectacle. And one of the things at the time that sort of stirred me was the think, thinking that, you know, all of these people have come to be inspired by me and I hope they're not going to be disappointed throughout the whole of my life. Um, but it was a very humbling experience too, because I thought, who am I that these people have come to see? And then afterwards, I had to remind myself that it wasn't me they'd come to, but to the ordination of a priest, which is very important. 
um, even today. I think the biggest challenge is the challenge of apathy. Uh, apathy to, uh, people are apathetic towards religion. Um, and I think that that comes largely from, well, I, uh, one of the books that I think that have, has influenced this in a film was The uh, Da Vinci Code, which um, sort of took away from Jesus the idea that he is God, that, that, that he is in, in some sense just another person, maybe a, a, a prophet, even a great prophet, but only a prophet. And, and I have encountered people who call themselves Catholic who will say things like, Muhammad is his equal. Uh, now I'm not trying, to, not trying to say that anybody is, is less than they are, but for us as Christians, we, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And of course, he's the only one who made such a claim. Um, and, and I find that, you know, that apathy among even Catholics very difficult to countermand. And I, it isn't just, of course, the fact that they've been subverted, as it were, by the book, because I think a lot of people today, they don't want to take on responsibility for their religion, and so they'd rather lie in bed on a Sunday. In fact, one lady who lives not far away from here, when asked why she didn't bring her child to Mass, said, oh, Sunday's my downtime. She worked all week, so she wanted Sunday to be her downtime which I found surprising, but, you know, I, I mean, I live in a bit of an ivory tower religiously, uh, in being in the presbytery and in the church. I don't experience things like that um, on a personal level, but I do understand how they, they feel like that. And finally, have you got any tips for the youngsters to tell them how God is calling them? Well, I think that f f for young people, they have to be open to the possibility I have talked to young people in school, to the boys, about the possibility of being priests, and they will be utterly taken aback by even the very idea of it. And I think that's one thing, and certainly for parents of young boys, uh, certainly thinking about priests for the future, they have to stop thinking that priests come from other families, not their family. Priests can come from any family. They can be from high-born or low-born. They can be from rich or poor. They can be from anywhere. Much of it is about nurture. And I think parents need to remember that the power of their nurture towards their ch child, and I've tried to outline it with my mother and my dad, um, but um, their, the power of their nurture is not to be underestimated. They will lead their young people to become priests for the future and the church will be reassured of its priests if they do their, their, their bit too. Thank you very much for your time, Father, and sharing your valuable experiences with us about your vocation. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for allowing me to share such thoughts with you. Being a priest is a privilege. I, I think we need to start off with that. It's a pri I, it is a privilege that I really believe is mine. And I think that young people today are so, um, that they get tied up into things that uh, are, are separate from being privileged to, to, to work with other people. They want to work with machinery and they, in fact, even their communications with each other is often on Facebook and through um, impersonal things. And I, and I wish that young people could buy into the whole idea of being a priest is to enable other people to be whatever they will be in their lives and helping them to be um, really good at, the, at and happy at being the kind of person they are. They mustn't, uh, I, I do believe that young people ought not to um, think only in terms of the bad press that the church gets because, you know, it's like saying all Englishmen are bad. They're not, you, know, you can't say that kind of thing, but for me, for, uh, being a priest is, is a really a, 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 a personal happiness. And I, I hope that young people can in some sense find a way for themselves to find out about how life as a priest can be happy. It's something that they need to work out with their peer group, with their priest, talk to them about how they could fit into 
being a priest in the church, it is vitally important. The, the less priests that we have, the less pre people are able to come into contact with the church, the less people are able to come into contact with God. It often is the case that without the church's support, young people do not come into contact with God. And they think that some of the things that the world has or has to offer are godlike, and they're not. They're very empty. I pray God's blessing on and Shalom TV and the work that you do in, in proclaiming the good news of plentiful redemption through the, the, the media. And pray God's blessing also on the audiences, those who, who listen to and, and, and watch your programs. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shalom World, God's own channel.